well, let's try that again. <laughs> we had a little technical difficulty that threw everything off. We almost didn't film it, and we almost didn't do announcements. The biggest announcement for today is tonight we're having missions, so please join us at 6 o'clock. And I've heard a little bit about the menu, and it's going to be amazing, so you want to be here. Uh, definitely going to be a fun time as we talk about what all God's doing in Spain, and we also, of course, enjoy some wonderful food. Also, ladies, be here next Sunday so you can pick up your copy of Praying the Names of God. You can pick it up next Sunday. I know they're up here now, but you can pick it up next Sunday. Because next Sunday is we're the first Sunday of May. And May is when all this begins. And so remember, May 15th, May 21st, and May... Make sure I have that right. 29th will be this, the days in May. I, I thought I had it memorized, and I think I did, and I was going to say it, but I quit trusting myself. But those three... Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday in May, we'll be going through this, and it's going to be, is it going to be here? Am I on those Tuesdays? 1030. You guys will be doing a great study on praying the names of Jesus, and if you can't join in person, you can join online. That's the expectation and the hope, so it's really going to be a great time and a great study. And today we're in our second week in Romans, uh, the next of our study of four has to do with grace and how last week we talked about how God's grace is greater than the law, which is, which is true and which is great and which is neat, but it's not very personal. It was high level. Well, today Paul's going to bring this down and Paul's going to say, yes, and grace is greater than my weakness. Grace is greater than your weakness, our weakness. It gets personal. It gets in the bones here. And so as we get into the study, we're going to hit some, some verses that I will tell you on a high level, seems like, wow, where are you going and what are you saying? When really get into it, I hope you'll stay with us and see that Paul's really nailing down that your greatest day, your darkest day, it doesn't matter. God's grace goes deeper than all of that. Amen? So if you have your Bibles and you're in chapter 7, read with me verses 14 to 25. This is Paul speaking in the beginning of 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I hate... But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, sorry, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want to do, I do not. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I'm doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, my flesh... Wow. Can I just say that Paul gets wordy? He gets wordy in the best way, but he really paints a picture here, and he gets wordy. And if we take this from just the level of we're only looking at Romans 7, 14 to 25, we can really get lost in what Paul is saying because to understand Romans 7, 14, 25, we got to go back and look at Romans 6. If you remember a few weeks ago, we were in Romans chapter 6, and Romans chapter 6 is all about the non-believing person. And then Romans 7 is the believing Paul. 
He's not speaking past tense. He's speaking present tense. He's not speaking random group of people. He's speaking me. And he's saying, me in my present condition has this battle waging within me. This passage could almost be, and I say almost as in John Maxwell calls it, the four lamentations of Paul. How he is lamenting what is going on inside of himself. And so the question I have, and I like to ask questions, and I never ask for a show of hands, and I don't want a show of hands now, but I'll go ahead and raise my hand and say, is anyone in here willing to admit that sometimes they have weakness? Anyone willing to admit that sometimes they have a struggle? Anyone willing to admit that even as maybe not a younger Christian, but maybe a little bit of a longer Christian, maybe even as a sanctified, redeemed, washed in the blood of Christ Christian, they sometimes still may struggle. Do you ever, like Paul, find yourself stating, I do what I don't want to do, and I'm not doing what I want? to do anybody ever been there did anybody know what i'm talking about if so this passage hopefully by the end of the day will make sense and will bring joy to yourself and will bring joy in the fact that okay the struggle is real but i'm not bound to the struggle the struggle is real but god's grace supersedes the struggle the the desire to do and the the unfortunate reality of sometimes i don't do is real But God's grace goes so far beyond that weakness. Today, we're seeing that God's grace is greater than our weakness. God's grace is greater than our struggle. God's grace sets free from all of these things. Yes, like Paul, we can admit that sometimes we struggle. But I do want to point out here, and I've heard... Pastors go on a tangent down this road. When I was, I've heard friends of mine use this as an excuse. I've, during times of youthfulness, used this passage as an excuse to justify, well, of course I struggle, of course I sin. That's what I'm supposed to do. Because even Paul said, I find myself doing what I don't want to do, and I find myself not doing what I want to do. And that was my great excuse. I could have gotten a tattoo of that on my arm. I didn't. I don't like needles. And then as an older person, I'm glad I didn't get that tattoo. But that could have, that was always a great excuse. Well, yeah, I'm a, it's okay that I sin because I find myself like Paul doing what I don't want to do and not doing what I want to do. It became our great excuse. And that is not what Paul is saying at all. Because remember, at this moment, Paul is the writer of Romans. At this moment, Paul had founded churches. At this moment, Paul had spent 15 years in the desert, in essence, with the Holy Spirit. Paul had been taught by God. Paul had been a long-time believer. At this moment, Paul was on missionary journeys founding the church. Paul is not saying that I am continually in sin and I just can't get free from it. That's not what Paul said. Paul is lamenting the struggle between who I am and who is continually sometimes waging war against myself. And what I would like to say and kind of what is going on with Paul and what happens with us and what happens as we grow closer to God is is the more we see the righteousness and the holiness of God, the more we see the perfection of Christ the more we see how far we are from that. Even as a believer, even as a sanctified believer, even as someone who has spent most of their life walking with God, if you will, at that moment, when you see how holy and righteous and perfect Jesus is and how holy and righteous and perfect God is, there's this shrinking that can happen in us, which is a good thing, as we realize who He is and how far we are from that. As I was writing the message, and sometimes I write sentences and then I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I have the guts to say that or not as I'm actually preaching, but let me just say it. Please, as a believer, never become so arrogant 
that you think you've reached God's holy standard. Because the great Paul is saying right here, I am so far from God's holy standard. At one point he says, oh, wretched man that I am. As he sees Christ's perfection and as he sees God's holiness, you realize that I am so far away from that. Now we could end the message, or I could continue this message on in the same vein, and you would think, wow, I really hate these kind of sermons. I am just getting beaten up here. But let me go ahead and just tell you the real secret. It is by grace you are saved through faith. Amen. We're talking about grace here today. We're talking about, about what grace does for us. It is by grace. It is not by my deeds. It is not by my adherence to a set of rules. It is not by me doing the things that I'm supposed to do or me not doing the things that I'm not supposed to do. It is by grace. It is not by the lack of bad actions on my part. It is not by my ability to avoid substance or to avoid language or to avoid the actions of certain people. It is not that I am counted righteous because of my membership or my deed or my tithe or of my attendance or any of these things. It is by the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone where we are considered righteous. I think Peter is by far my favorite failure. And then I call him a failure. I call him my favorite failure because I think there's so many times that Peter does something and I think, yeah, I probably would have done that. I don't know if I would have had the moment of, of strength, but I probably would have had the moment of weakness. And I'm kind of like I see myself similar to Peter in a lot of ways, though sometimes I think he was stronger than I would be. But I think that there's times where I probably would have failed like him. And what I really like about Peter is in the really, really big things, he's successful. But in the little bitty things, he fails. What a weird combination. And I'll give you some examples real quick. So here's an example number one. In the really, really big thing, when a whole group of guards come charging in to take Jesus, he pulls out a sword and he attacks that's a big moment. That's a I'm willing to die for you right now in a tangible way moment. But when a little bitty girl asks her, aren't you with Jesus? He's like, no, I'm not. So when it's a bunch of guys with swords, he's ready to fight. When it's a little girl in a dark room area, he's like, no, 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 don't make it me. That moment, he's a coward. He'll to thousands of Jews and an absolute revival breaks out in that moment and 3,000 of them come to Christ right then, this great moment. He did that. Yet if you flip over to Galatians, and I'll just read it to you. In Galatians, this is Paul writing. Paul says, But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned for prior to the coming of certain men from James. So before all of these high uppity Jews showed up, and before that he was eating with Gentiles, and he was eating the food that, that the law would say not to eat. Peter was like the lover of shrimp cocktails, in essence, up until some Jews came in, and then suddenly, suddenly it was no longer right to be around those guys. It was no longer right to eat shrimp cocktails with my beach buddies, in essence, is what Paul's saying. So I opposed him because he was wrong. So in that moment, even when he's the head, almost the head of the church, when he is way up there, he is Peter. He's known as Peter. Everybody revered him, in essence. He still has this failure moment where he's like, oh, no. People are watching, and because people are watching, I want to look holier than I am, and I'm not going to eat with those sinners, is what Peter did. But then later, he would go to the cross and tell them, turn it upside down. That was really southern. Turn it upside down so that I don't, I don't die in the same way as Jesus, because I'm not even worthy of that. Big moments he was successful. Little bitty moments, which makes my favorite failure. So what can we learn from Peter? What I can tell you we're learning from Peter is absolutely what Paul is talking about. In verses 14 to 7, where Paul said, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh. 
sold into the bondage of sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. But if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law. I confess that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. If you're taking notes, here's the first thing I want you to write down from this passage. We're going to go through four things that Paul is basically lamenting. As in Paul is decrying of the self of the Christian. Paul is saying, these are the things that drive me crazy about being a believer. The first one I want you to write down is that the old me no longer controls me. And that's going to go through all That's our big point. The old me no longer controls me. Why? Because of grace, right? But it can frustrate me. First thing, I think the old me is like a three-year-old sometimes. It, it can really frustrate me, right? In the room today, we can talk about them. The old me can frustrate me. Right? The old you can frustrate you. It can be in your way. It can drive you crazy. Grace is greater than your weakness, but it doesn't eliminate it. That's what Paul's getting at. Grace is greater than your weakness, but it doesn't eliminate it. Verse 14, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh. He's drawing a picture. He's stating, we know that the things of God, they are righteous. When he says spiritual here, he means righteous. He means holy. He means perfected. He means the things of God are a standard that God puts in me when I become a believer, but I still am human. And so, yes, there is within me a new creature, a new creation. There is within me a a holy membership to the things of God. There's within me a driver's license in the city of heaven, if you will, right now. I am absolutely counted among God's group. I am a member of heaven. I am one of His own. I am a child of God right this second, but I too am still human. And so that's my struggle. That's what can frustrate me is that I am and I, my heart goes to and my beliefs goes to God's things. But I still have flesh and bone. I still have corrupted body. I still have a knee that hurts sometimes. I still am human. God's holiness can lead to a fear of God, and it should. But it, it's not terror. It's not a freight. It's openness. And so what Paul is stating right here, and put yourself in this picture, if you will. In the presence of perfect beauty, I feel ugly. Right? In the presence of perfect beauty, I feel ugly. We see this today. We see this today with a generation who is on every kind of anxiety and depression med you can find because social media is a lie. And they're like, my family, my friends, my whoever, everything is going great for them. They're living life and I struggle you know right now if you were to go to California don't but if you were go if you were to go to California right now there are areas where influencers it's a job where people have their influencers they'll go and they'll rent what looks like the inside of an airplane and they'll pay their fee and they'll take pictures of themselves inside of this private jet where we're on our way to Cancun or to this place or to this place or to this place because they live this online persona that's not real. It's the idea that look like they're traveling to Greece or traveling to this place or this place. And they create all of this life that they're not even living. And they pay by the hour to look like they're doing what they're not doing in the presence of perfect beauty we feel ugly how much more so in the presence of the actual beautiful perfection of god do we love? that's what the fear of god is this openness when i open myself up to god in beauty i feel ugly in the presence of perfect truth 
I feel like a lie. I feel false. In the presence of perfect goodness, I feel evil. And in the presence of God's holiness, every knee will bow will confess that Jesus is Lord. Paul is not saying that I am out there sinning every single day. Paul is saying in the presence of the perfection of God, I feel the struggle. Right then I see how far I have to go. Paul says, for what I am doing I do not understand in verse 15. This isn't confusion. Paul's not saying confused. Or Paul's not saying, you know what, I, it just happened, I sinned again. Paul is actually, what he's stating here is he's speaking of what I approve of. The things that my heart approve of, sometimes I don't find myself doing. And the things that I find myself doing sometimes is not what I actually approve of. Then my heart, my desire, my, my God-given new identity sometimes does not approve of the moment of anger I just Shout it out. It does not approve. My allegiance is not to the failure I just had. What is he saying? He said, sometimes there's nothing quite as frustrating to me as the me I just was a moment ago. Can we get an amen on that one? Anybody else ever been there? Is it just me and Paul? I don't think so. I think we've all been there. Sometimes I get on my nerves more than anyone else does because I'm not aligning to who I truly am. And who I truly am is who God made me to be. Paul is saying this as a believer, sometimes I do not approve of the things that I have done. and I do not approve of the one who I am. To me, I think this is a great test for anyone in the church. This is a great test of of whether or not my faith goes more than membership deep. Is it simply, do I simply go to church because it's what I'm supposed to do? Do I simply go to church because that's where I'm a member of? Do I go just on Christmas and Mother's Day? Is it, is it simply a skin level thing or is it a tangible deep to the spirit thing? Well, here's the great question. It's not whether or not you do an action occasionally, but whether or not you approve of that action. Does it haunt you? Does it break your heart? Does, does a failure, a sin, a mistake, does it absolutely haunt you? Do you look at your actions, you're like, man, I can't believe I did that again. Or do you look at your actions and not see anything wrong at all? It's whether or not I align myself with God's ways or not. Do I approve of the old self or has there been... Do I approve of the change? Does it bother you at all? A believer will always agree with God's standard, even though they sometimes don't live up to it. Right? Amen, church? A believer is always going to approve to God's standard, even if they sometimes don't line up to it. They, they, did, they didn't do it perfect. I didn't perfectly do this or do this or do this, which we know makes sense, which is why... I, John wrote that, you know what, Jesus is right there as the mediator for those moments you don't line up because it's going to happen. But if Jesus has changed your allegiance and now your allegiance is Him, you're not going to approve of those things that go against Him. That's what He's saying here. The old you may still, it's dead, it's dead, but it's still here. But the new you, the new you is dominant. So the first thing is that the old, the old me, while no longer controlling me, can certainly frustrate me. Secondly, the old me, while no longer in control of me, can certainly fail me. F-E-L-L, not F-A-I-L. F-E-L. It can fail me as in like you fell a tree, you cut down a tree. The point I'm trying to make is that the old you, your old self, can trip you up. Right? The old you can trip you up. And Paul's going to make this point here in a moment. That the old you, though, though no longer in control of you, can trip you. Verses 18 to 20. 
Paul says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. As I mentioned, he's getting really wordy. That's a really long way to say sometimes I trip myself up. Sometimes, sometimes I can mess myself up. Again, if you were to flip over to Romans 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, Paul says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. That's verses 6 and 7. He is not arguing against that previous point. He is stating that that was the non-believer, and when the non-believer becomes a believer, the old self is in essence nailed to the cross. The old self dies, but that, as for the believer, that doesn't change the fact that sometimes the old you can trip you up. While 6-6, that person is totally controlled by the old self. Paul is saying the old self is now dormant. It's not dominant. The new you is the dominant you, but in essence, kind of like a base camp, as John Maxwell put it, a base camp where sin can launch off of into life. The old self is dominant, is dormant, but can trip you up. The new you is dominant. The old you is dormant, but can trip you up. Spiritual me rules But until Jesus returns, the flesh me, the flesh that is in me, can sometimes. The the human control of Daniel anymore, the the new creation spiritual Daniel is in control of Daniel now. But, but until Jesus returns and gives what a new true body new creation new everything until jesus makes me totally new with a new nature the the dormant me can sometimes trip me up it can sometimes if i'm not cautious if i'm not careful if i'm not paying attention it can trip me up again remember the point of what paul's stating here is that god's grace goes further than my weakness and then sometimes my weakness can trip me up but god's grace catches me when that happens. God's grace goes further and deeper than that weakness. I think of John Mark when we think of this. Good old John Mark who went out on a journey with Paul and Barnabas on this great missionary journey. He's with Paul. It's not like he's with a rookie. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's with Paul. Right? I mean, of all the people you want to learn from, if it's not Jesus, I think Paul's a number two. He's the next guy I want to go with. And John Mark abandons him. Abandons him. He leaves so much so that there is this riff between Paul and John Mark that even gets to Barnabas, where Barnabas is like, I love you, Paul, but I'm going to go with John Mark because you're really hanging on to this. In essence. And there's an argument between theologians over what the reason was some think that the journey got hard it got difficult it wasn't fun anymore i gotta admit you get beat up a couple of times it's not fun anymore it it, it was pretty hard and john mark left but then there's others and i think it could be this because we saw in peter too where paul on his first journey as the gospels being opened up and being seen that this is not Judaism 2.0, this is really new. And this is to the Gentiles, and you you don't have to obey all of the laws of Judaism. You don't have to do all of the Jewish things. That in fact, this is very different. This is the fulfillment of Judaism. And they think that Peter and maybe John Mark struggled with that and struggled with all the Gentiles and struggled with the freedom that they were seeing. And say, so, you know what, these guys are... They're eating shrimp cocktails every day, and I can't deal with that because we're not supposed to do that. And so he walked away for a little bit. Whatever the reason was, there was a rift here and a a tripping here. And there was anger and frustration 
between them. And I think a one or the other we could see, or maybe in both, that the old self, while dormant, tripped them up for a little bit. And in that tripping them up, it allowed for a little bit of, of anger and frustration and I would say hatred, not that they hated each other, but I think Jesus made that point that if you're angry at your brother, you might as well have murdered your brother, according to him. There's hatred there. There's harshness there. And so that was the struggle we're seeing. And I would say thanks be to God that the old us no longer controls us, but sometimes it gets in our way. Sometimes the old us will get in our way, which brings us to our, our next point. Yes, the old you frustrates you, the old you can even trip you up, it can fail you, and the old you will fight against the new you. The old you, though it doesn't control you, fights against you. That's what we see from the old us. Verses 21 to 23, Paul says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wow. Paul stated, I am going to war with myself. And I tell you, we have to go to war with ourselves. I think a lot of times when we read something like this, I don't think we confuse it. I don't think we misunderstood it. I think we glance over that which Paul emphasizes. I think maybe we whisper the thing that Paul is shouting. Paul says, where I find the principle that evil is present in me. Some translations even say that sin, that sin is present in me. He said, I find that in me is evil. He's using big words. He's saying, I'm using, he's wickedness. I find that in me is wickedness. There's evil. There's bad. The actual translation would be destruction. I find within me is a destructive force. I find evil is there. And Paul is stating, he's talking about the principle, the law. He's talking about that, the ethos from which I now live my life, the, the thing God has taught me, the, what, the, the way I'm supposed to align to, my very core of my being is this way, and yet within me there also is a fight against an evilness that's there, that I've got this whole new me, that rules and dictates my life. And then I've got this evilness that's fighting against that. And I want to live by God's standard. But there's a struggle here. There is a fighting here. What I really am getting to, the word he uses, and I don't think it's accidental when he says that this is present in me, please understand he is not stating that within you is a sin nature. He's actually stating that it's, beside you like right here is you the new you but right here beside you crouching there is how we would say it's crouching there this ability this sin nature it takes us back to genesis genesis 1 through 8 chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 now the man had relations with his wife and she conceived and gave birth to cain and she said I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. It came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel also on his part brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had a regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and its countenance fell. And here's the verse. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. It's crouching right there beside you. That that nature, that failure, that ability is right there tied to you. It is crouching 
there. The old you no longer controls you. But it can frustrate you, it can trip you up, it can fight against you. And then finally, I'd say it can flank you. It means it can be right there in your way. At 24, when Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from a body of this death? That goes aligned with what we were just talking about, how it can be right there crouched, it can be right there tied to you. Paul is, I like to think, and a lot of people seem to think, that he is speaking of, or at least thinking of, Tarsus, where he's from. Tarsus had this very, very unusual, harsh way, I think, at least, in dealing with a murderer. If someone were to murder someone else, uh, they had a death penalty for it, but the way they did it is in Tarsus, they would tie the murderer to the body of their victim. They would tie him there. And so they were tied together, st- stuck laying in where they were being punished. And as the body decomposed, it would make the killer sick, and then they would eventually die as well. And so it was this horrible way to go, but you were tied to your victim. And Paul states here, who will set me free from this body of death? Who will set me free from it? A wretched man that I am. My sin nature, while it's not me now, it's tied to me. It's that's the body. It is tied to me. We, we executed it. We killed it. But it is tied right there to me. It's proportional. The closer you get, the more you see the holiness and the goodness of God, the more you see the grace because of the wretchedness of who we are, the wretchedness of who we were and who we are. It is by grace that our weakness is overcome. It is by grace that our weakness is set down. As a matter of fact, Paul answers his question. And this is the joy of this message. Like I told you, I can't leave you at the sad part. But Paul says, oh, wretched man, like who will set me free? He says, through, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the one who sets you free. He is the one whose grace goes breaking through. He is the one who gives the gift of righteousness to us. The challenge. And I hope you see the positive nature here. Paul is lamenting the four things that are tough to me, that, that the old me can frustrate me. It can, I can trip over it. It can fight against me. And it can even be kind of stuck to me. It can, be, it can flank me to where it's just right here with me. And how do I get free from the old me? It's every day through the grace of God which breaks through all of it. Every day through, through choosing His way, His purpose, His standard. Every day when I fell on it, having His grace breaking through it all. Every day as we close, I'm going to read. I love when these things work out. But today's devotion, today's devotion in this little book I read, goes exactly to the point Paul's making It's Jesus calling. Today's devotion, April 28th, says, As you look into the day that stretches out before you, you may see choice points along the way. The myriad possibilities these choices present can confuse you. Draw your mind back to the threshold of this day where I stand beside you, lovingly preparing you for what is ahead. You must make your choices one at a time since each is contingent upon the decision that precedes it. Instead of trying to create a mental map of your path through this day, focus on my loving presence with you. I will equip you as you go so that you can handle whatever comes your way. Trust me to supply what you need when you need it. Isn't that good? What a great reality that, that Jesus is standing right there at our side, guiding us walking with us, loving us, pointing us in His way. 
to his way and the, the grace of God very well goes bigger and deeper and stronger than our weakness. As I was preparing this message, I like to ask the question of myself, what is the point? What is the point of the message? What is it that we hope to get out of the message? What is the benefit for us in this message? And it's the reality that yes, yes, I may not be perfect. Believe it or not, we don't have to take a vote. I know the answer. I may not be perfect, but I am perfected by Him. I may not be holy, but I've received holiness from Him. I may not be righteousness, but I have become the righteousness of God. Because His very grace goes deeper than my weakness. and goes deeper than your weakness. And when God sees you, He sees that which is in you, which is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, thank you for a study on grace. Sometimes reading passages like this, we can can miss the point Paul's making. And the point Paul's making is, though there's always a struggle, the victory's already there. Moments of failure, the finality rests in Jesus Christ. Alone, your grace is so much deeper and bigger and stronger the momentary action or failure that I may have experienced, that you, God, sent your Son to die for us, and it's so everlasting and so loving and so big that it goes beyond my momentary struggles. And now that's not an excuse to just embrace the momentary struggle. It's the opposite. It's the striving, striving for holiness and comparing and seeing how holy you are And from that picture, seeing how wretched and far I am and finding joy in the true picture of grace that since I can't do it, you did it. Since I can't measure up, you only measured you. Thank you, God, for the gift of your son, Jesus. Amen. We hope to see you guys tonight, 6 o'clock for missions night.